Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I appreciate it. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, today I'm going to talk uh, about the work I performed at the, during my postdoctoral stay at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, during while well, this work was performed in GIST, uh, it, it was not aimed initially to characterize a monolithic protein. So we, uh, as uh, Dr. Miranda said, it, uh, it, well, I, my lab was specialized in genetic interactions with ESA1. And uh, we found a protein that interacts with uh, ESA1 that is a monolithic protein. And then is what, when we decided to see what happens with this protein. So, um, first I'll introduce ESA1 and then I'll talk about lysine. Okay, so, uh, as uh, post relational modifications are very important to regulate many cellular processes, and there are many types of post relational modifications. These include acetylation, methylation, phosphorylation, and recidivation, among others. And uh, these modifications regulate, for example, gene expression, replication, uh, repair, uh, recombination, lots of things. So in the, uh, I need to put <laughs> So. Okay, so um, in this talk I'm going to focus on histone acetylation. Uh, this is established by histone acetyl transferases and is removed by histone deacetylases. Um, ESA1 acetylates histone H4 and this mark is usually removed by the histone deacetylase RB3. In humans, there is another, there is a homolog called TIP60 which uh, the same as ESA1 structures uh, the new 4 histone acetyl transferase complex. Uh, TIP60 is very important in, human, in humans. Well, it's essential in both organisms. And uh, it is uh, implicated in many diseases. Uh, for example, it is dysregulated in cancer or in some neuro neurodegenerative diseases. Now I'm going to talk briefly about the, the model we used. Saccharomyces cerevisiae is an exogenetic model. So we uh, used three, uh, three of the tools that, of Saccharomyces. One of them is our gene deletions, which is just replacing the Uh, 
growth axis. So in these experiments, the cell cultures of the different strains are normalized to a specific OD, and then they are diluted and plated on different plates, depending on uh, what we want to test. So for example, for DNA damage, we would uh, plate on a plate that has a drug that induces those drug breaks. And so, um, the one type of strain would grow just fine. The mutant one would have some problems, and the mutant one combined with mutant two would grow better than mutant one, but still not as good as one type. So this is how a suppression would look like. Um, so going back to ESA one, it has many uh, phenotypes. The ESA one four or four strain, for example, is sensitive to DNA gam to the part of sensitivity. And uh, in here, in a plate that is uh, grown at 37 degrees, there is about 404 cells cannot grow. Uh, this strain is also sensitive to DNA damage. And uh, in here, in a plate that has gamtotisin, which is a drug, which is a drug that induces DNA double strand breaks, uh, the cells have a hard time growing too. This strain is also has low acetylation levels in histone H4. Um, so now we come to uh, get to know life 20. <laughs> so when we perform a genetic screen to figure out what uh, well, a high copy suppressor, we're well, looking for high copy suppressors of ISA1, and found that overexpression of life 20 could suppress the DNA damage sensitivity of ISA 1414 in catalytism. So uh, the next step then was to check if the catalytic activity of life 20 was important for this. And uh, so we we mutated uh, aspartic acid in the 155. Uh, to Alani. This is the catalytic residue of this protein. And uh, we call this mutant life 20 cat. And uh, when we did this, we found that uh, it could still suppress the ISA 414 sensitivity to DNA damage. So the, the catalytic activity of life 20 is not important for suppressing. Is about 404, so it may be doing something else. So in this uh, experiment, we had the control of a strain that could not synthesize lysine, which is in the bad way that it works. And uh, we can see that the lysine when it had mutant uh, cannot grow in the absence of lysine. This is when uh, our lab uh, figured out that it was a monoline protein. So then. Uh, I want to talk briefly about LIS20. So LIS20 is a homocytrate synthase. This is the first enzyme of the lysine biosynthesis pathway. Uh, it converts two oxyglutarate to three homocytrate uh, with acetyl -co coin as, an, as a cofactor. Uh, what was strange when it was described uh, initially, it, it was that it is localized in the nucleus. And most of the proteins in metabolic pathways uh, are mostly localized in cytoplasm or mitochondria. So people were asking what's happening with this protein that is localized, in the, mostly in the nucleus. So in fact, you can see here the mitochondria, and it doesn't seem to be there. And uh, this gene homocytric, well, this protein homocytric synthase is coded by two genes, LIS20 and LIS21. These are parallels. And uh, they have very similar protein sequences. You can see here, well, here there are other fungi compared to uh, the two here. These two are uh, less than less than one. And you can see the dark part is like all the concert uh, amino acids. Uh, and in color, are some areas that have been described to be important for the catalytic function. And uh, the difference is mostly found in the N-terminal and C-terminal regions of the proteins. So 
we also tested the glycine one could suppress the ISA one phenotypes and found that it couldn't. So glycine one cannot suppress the ISA one for one for DNA damage sensitivity. So uh, next step was well the question was how does lysine one expression support suppress ISA one for one for and uh, the first thing I did was to try to localize the bifunctional domain. <laughs> and to do this, I did side directed mutagenesis to then do uh, structure function analysis. And uh, we already knew the structure of the protein. So uh, we know that lysine forms homolimers, and that this green part contacts the catalytic region, which is this one, of the other monomer. And so uh, we tested some proteins in the lead, some proteins, some amino acids in the lead. This region is called the lead. Some uh, amino acids in the catalytic region, some others in uh, some uh, conserved regions, and also uh, domain the citrullinal region that I believe a 20 amino acid region that turned out to be the more like in domain, <laughs> as you will see. So. Uh, I did the lesion assays again, overexpressing this uh, gene in uh, less than less than one node strain to see if it was still able to synthesize lysine. And found that most of the mutants that I made uh, were unable to synthesize lysine. Uh, only, for example, the, the monadic domain, uh, well, the mutant with the monadic domain, uh, was still able to synthesize lysine. But when we tested the ISO 1404 strain for expression of these uh, different mutants, found that most of them could still suppress. But the one mutated in the moonlighting domain could not suppress anymore the DNA damage sensitivity of ISO 1404. So this is interesting because this domain is not really conserved in any of the other gists. So as it happens with many monadic proteins, they are considered to be a recent evolution, and so they are not found uh, in close relatives sometimes. Uh, so the next question was, was repair, what repair pathway is affected in ISA 1404 mutants, and how does lysine expression suppress the defect? I'll tell you the response before telling you what, like all the experiments, because sometimes it's hard to follow without knowing what's going to happen. So, um, what we figured is that ISO1 mutants have uh, defects in repairing DNA damage directly at the DNA double strand break. So, these uh, cells have, uh, well, normally when there's a DNA double strand break, uh, there's increased acetylation at the break, and this leads to uh, histone eviction to allow recruitment of proteins involved in repair. So in, uh, in ISA1 mutants, we found that acetylation is low at the breaks, and also there's no histone eviction. Uh, when lysine is overexpressed, there's tons of lysine recruited to the breaks, and this leads to recruitment of high levels of a chromatin regulating complex that uh, allows uh, histone eviction normally in this strain. So this is the way we figured out, well, this is what we figured out, figured out happened with lysine. Now I'll tell you how we did it. So the first question was to test maybe our expression of lysine was just increasing uh, acetylation levels, global acetylation levels, of the ISA1 mutants. So it, we needed to do this control because it's a histone acetyl transferase. But found that when LIX20 is overexpressed, the low histone acetylation levels in the cell remain. So this was not the way LIX20 was suppressing the phenotypes. Then we tested if LIX20 could bind chromatin because it's a nucleus. And uh, we did some fractionation experiments um, 
where we got crude chromatin and then purified chromatin and uh, ran Western blocks and found that limestone is mostly found in the bound chromatin, same as CR2, which is a protein that is known to be bound chromatin. PGK1 was the control for a mostly cytoplasmic protein, and we can observe that there are less, well, lower levels of this protein in the chromatin fraction. When we uh, induced DNA damage, we observed uh, slightly higher levels of lice 20 at the breaks in a similar way, at the breaks, sorry, at the chromatin, in a similar way to CO2, which we know that it also is recruited to the double strand breaks. Then is when we uh, asked if lice 20 could be doing something directly at the double strand breaks. So this, this pathway is very well described in yeast. I will just tell you a few things about this pathway. Uh, when there's a double strand break, then there's a initial phosphorylation of histone H2A uh, through two kinases, MEG1 and TEL1. Also, there are increased levels of acetylation mediated by UE4, which is the complex where ISA1 works. Uh, there are uh, then uh, protein replenishing complexes are recruited. For example, the inoid complex is recruited and this allows histone eviction. There are other chromatin remodeling complexes like risk one and slide sniff, which are also important for uh, opening the chromatin and allowing recruitment of late repair factors like uh, uh, RAT52, for example. So to test uh, if lice, well, where could lice 20 be doing something, we tested if overexpression of lice 20 could suppress phenotypes of other mutants in the pathway I showed you. And uh, found that it couldn't suppress, well, for example, I included the H2A as 129A mutant, which cannot do the initial phosphorylation of H2A. Uh, or for example, the one, the kinase uh, mutant, RAT52, this is a late repair factor. And we found that lifestyle expression could not really suppress uh, other strains uh, affecting the repair pathway. Uh, only, well, ISA1 was the one that where we saw a clear phenotype of suppression. So we figured that the, the role of lifespan should be early in the repair pathway. So to test the, what was happening directly, happening directly at the DNA double strand breaks, we used a reporter. So the reporter uh, is a strain that has a uh, homing endonuclease coded, uh, well regulated by a, an inducible promoter, gal So when cells are grown uh, in raffinose, this promoter is not repressed, not repressed, nor activated. And uh, but when galactose is added to the media, the uh, gene is highly induced. This leads to expression of this endonuclease that only produces a single cut in the whole genome, a single double strand break. And then we use chromatin immunoprecipitation to analyze modification or recruitment factors directly to the break. Uh, 0.6 kilobases downstream of the double strand break. So it's in here, more or less. And uh, what we first tested was recruitment of ISA1 to the break. So this was, or this was already described, ISA1 was recruited to the breaks. And we, well, we had our control non antibody chromatic immunoprecipitation vector transform the strains, which are wild type, and lice 20 were expressing strains. And so in wild type strains, lice ISA1 is recruited to the break one and two hours after induction. And when lice 20 is overexpressed, uh, similar levels of ISA1 were recruited to the break. So this means that lice 20 is not suppressing ISA1 through recruitment of high levels of, of ISA1. Then we tested if lice 20 uh, was recruited to, to the breaks 
and found that it is included one and two hours after break induction. And uh, when it is overexpressed, there are higher levels of livestock recruited to the break. Um, next thing we tested were histone modifications. And we tested histone H for lysine fiber acetylation and found that uh, in wild type cells, acetylation of H4 increases one and two hours after break induction. But in ISA 414 cells, there's no increase. So when we tested for histone levels at the break, we found that, uh, well, we know that in wild type cells, histone levels uh, diminish normally because they have to be removed from the break to allow recruitment of other factors. Uh, but in ISA 1414 cells, the histones remain there, they even increase a little. So uh, this means there is no addiction. When we, did the, when we did the rate of histone acetylation relative to histone levels, we found a very high signaling of acetylation in one type, but not in the ISO 1414 cells. So uh, to further our next slide likes when they roll at the breaks, we used the methods that I, con I constructed before, the catalytic mutant that uh, can still suppress that damage but not synthesize lysine and the molaline mutant, which can, uh, cannot suppress the DNA damage sensitivity of ISA1. I repeated the experiment of histone acetylation and found that only the catalytic mutant could suppress the defect of acetylation, whereas the molaline mutant had low levels of uh, acetylation of histone H4. And when we tested the histone eviction of histone H3, found that lysine cat strains looked like they were losing histones at the break as we expected, but the lysine immune mutant couldn't. And when we did the rate, we found that the signaling was normal only for the strain that was overexpressing the catalytic mutant, but the, not the monoidic mutant. So we thought then that the problem was something uh, related to remodeling complexes. And the question, were, uh, the question was, which uh, remodeling complex is important for that? So I constructed double mutants combining ISA1 with uh, mutants in different chromatin remodeling complexes. So risk one affects Nocturnal nucleosome mobilization in, uh, by risk, ARC8 uh, histone eviction by the chromatic remodeling complex in you know, 80, and SNP5 synapses and hololos recombination by the SWI SNP complex. And uh, these double methods were tested uh, with our expression of LIS20 to see if uh, there could, we could still see suppression. And we found that. Uh, uh, the risk one complex was not necessary for suppression. Same with the SNP5 complex. This so is SNP. But the ino complex, we needed it to be there to be able to see suppression. So this means that the ino complex is important for this. So we tested what happens with ino at the breaks and found that, well, there's a slight increase in InnoID recruitment at the break in wild type and ISO1 strains. However, when lysone cat is overexpressed, there's a huge increase in the InnoID recruitment at the break. And uh, in here I had a control of protein levels of InnoID that were unaffected by our expression of any of the mutants. So the next thing we tested were, was if uh, InnoAD was interacting directly with LIS20. And we did uh, co-immunoprecipitation. Um, we immunoprecipitated MCTAC InnoAD, uh, which is this one, well, tons of bags in there. <laughs> and uh, tested if, if LIS20 would come 
uh, with the neural precipitation of Pino and found that it did indeed uh, independently of if the modal domain was there. So the interaction between the Lysonia and Pino is independent of the modal domain. However, we found that the moonlighting domain is important for recruitment of livestock into the DNA double strand brace. We did this chromatine immune precipitation and found that the livestock cat uh, mutant is recruited normally to the brace, but the moonlighting mutant is not the one that doesn't have the moonlighting domain. So, uh, just to uh, summarize, what happens in uh, what type of strains when there's a DNA double strand break, uh, histone secretion increases and uh, histones are evicted from the break. In IED and Lysonia are, are recruited there at some level. In ISA 1404 mutants, uh, histone acetylation is low and also histones remain there. And when Lysonia is overexpressed, a lot of Tons of lives when you are recruited to the break, these interact with inoid and promote high levels of recruitment of inoid to the break and normal histone addiction. And this allows the salts to repair uh, normally. Um, and just to finish, I'd like to talk about the regulation of Lysoni. So we, when, when I was working with this protein, uh, I found that its protein levels are affected very easily by many factors. And uh, so, well, interestingly, DNA damage doesn't seem to affect at all the protein levels of livestock. But we have some preliminary data uh, showing that histone, well, the post-traditional modification of livestock through acetylation is increased when there is DNA damage. So it seems it could be uh, post-traditional and modification of lifestyle, what is regulating that. Um, however, well, when there's lysine in medium, uh, protein levels of lifestyle increase. Also, we had a superoxide dismutase uh, mutant, which has high levels of superoxide, and found that lifestyle levels are very high in this strain. However, when you grow uh, yeast for a long time, the lifestyle levels uh, are reduced at the older the culturates. And uh, life 21 levels remain the same. So this, it is unaffected by, by cell density. Also, uh, Dr. Alicia Brooks described uh, well, that carbon source is also important for regulating life 20 protein levels. And uh, just to conclude, I think that uh, life 20 could belong to a, a cup repair pathway, so we were not able to see that it was doing something at the break at the beginning because there was no problem with repair at all. But if we have some problem with repair, then we are able to see it. However, uh, well, and I think that environmental factors are important to make the protein decide if it's going to help, help or not repair depending on, well, it will affect its protein levels and when it's low, it's not going to do anything to help repair. Uh, and well, there are many things to do with this protein, but some things that could be done is to test uh, how its stability is regulated, uh, how is its post-relational regulation, and how does nice money and inoid interact, for example. Um, just to finish, I'd like to thank uh, the Pilots Lab and also the, the fellowship that I got during my postdoctoral stage.